thank you. Um, it's always uh, stressful to speak in front of experts. Um, and today is even more stressful because uh, the chairman of Asia Pacific for UI is also my chairman. So I cannot make up stories. <laughs> so Dr. Sik, thank you. And be nice. So uh, just to um, do uh, just maybe a quick um, uh, couple things about the company uh, for, the, for the ones that you don't know what we do, to just kind of put things in context, uh, what I want to talk about uh, next. So we, we are in the logistic real estate business. So we manage, we develop, manage, and own about 600 million square feet of uh, warehouse uh, space across um, China, US, uh, Brazil, uh, and Japan. And that's, that's a lot of warehouses. So typically, if you live in these countries, most likely something that you wear or something you ate came from a warehouse. We also a fund manager. We manage about um, 39 billion of um, asset. Currently about 27 is deployed and another 12 billion to be deployed. So that's roughly about the company. And what I want to talk more about today's topic is about technology. How is that challenging or changing uh, the landscape of our business and also our customers? And because we're in many markets, I want to just pick uh, China to, to talk, uh, talk about it. Uh, why China? Because I think um, one is efficiency. The logistics sector um, costs about 18% of GDP for China. Again, that's a big economy. 18% goes to logistic. How is that compared to other countries? US is about 9%. So it's very inefficient. But it's, it's a large, large uh, component. It's the largest single component of, of the economy. And a lot of that is because inefficiency, a lot of that is because technology is not up to standard. But we also want to talk about it. China is also another market that is changing faster than US or Japan or any of the country we've seen or Europe uh, with e-commerce, uh, with technology, with transportation. Uh, what we were seeing uh, last five years, the change is, is, is amazing. And I want to talk about some of the things that we see on the ground. So here's a snapshot, logistics in China. Basically, transportation make up most of the cost. It's because at any given time, 40% of trucks on the road is empty. So it's not very efficient. So you have these mom and pop uh, owns one or two trucks in their company. They have, a, they have the ability to secure an order and they deliver from one city to the next, but they don't have to return, return the order in hand. So they come back empty because it costs them too much to sit around waiting for the next order. So we're seeing technology and that sector evolving to doing the uh, matching in the platform. So that's changing quite fast. And the rest, 36% is about labor, packaging, Actually, warehouse rent that we charge only make up 10%. So the book of cost is actually outside the rental cost. So 36%, we're going to see that change dramatically as well. China is very labor intensive. But I would predict in five years' time, at least half the labor will be gone. We are working and investing in robotic, ro robotic companies that are replacing some of these laborers at the warehouse. So again, uh, I, I, I will go over uh, more in details about each of these changes in each sector. These are the hot words people talk about uh, in, the, you know, in, the, in the today's uh, digital world. Uh, share economy, automation, robotics. What does it mean? Well, basically, I can imagine in the, in the future, uh, even our warehouse will be entered the share economy. Currently, our model is pretty straightforward. Someone come to us, lease it for uh, three years, five years, 10 years, and they have the warehouse to themselves. Uh, someday, warehouse will not be rented. I do not believe warehouse had to be rented that way. I believe warehouse in the future will be rented on per use. I believe in the future, warehouse will be rented on per partial that go through the, the warehouse. Because right now, our current revenue model, our business model, have no way of charging other than by per square foot per month or per year. But I do believe with automation equipment, with robotics, you can track partials that go through and you can charge rent by partial. So that is something that we experiment with some of the customers already uh, in China. Automation and robotics. 
when we first entered the business in China 10 years ago, people were so focused on um, just throw more labor to, to the problem. Labor cost has been increasing double digit for the last five years, and it will continue to increase. Because the sing single child policy, it actually, we start seeing less and less people willing to work in uh, labor job, uh, manual labors. So companies, our customers, are willing to start investing in robotics and automations. Uh, and then because the cost of robotics and automation is getting become cheaper and cheaper, it makes sense to do that. And we've seen a lot of conversion already in, uh, uh, in our facility. So what we did, we set up uh, a financial, financial leasing company. Um, and we start releasing automation equipment and robotics to our customers. So in our business, I don't care if you want to lease facility or you want to lease automation equipment or you want to lease from uh, us uh, robotics. We provide that. Um, so again, we've seen, we've seen that uh, emerging uh, in, in, our, in our customers. We're also seeing that uh, lifestyle changing. In the past, people go and buy their uh, vegetable and their meat in the wet markets. Well, now people worry about health and safety, so now they need to buy it from um, supermarkets. So cold chain become a, um, a very uh, much part of the um, uh, you know, key part to, to, to our business. And I remember we were talking to one of our customer. Um, they said that um, their ice cream, it was frozen uh, when left the manufacturer, and it was frozen when they sold the customer, but in between, it melted. And they couldn't tr keep track of that. So now we have sensors that track temperature changes all the way through when it left the manufacturer, all the way to the consumer. We can track uh, these uh, temperature variations. And when the door, when the door of the uh, frozen truck is open and closed. So again, that is technology uh, in play. E-commerce has been a major driver of our, our business. Uh, when we first started uh, our business, less than 3% of facility were used by a company like Amazon. Today in China, 27% uh, of the space are leased to uh, e-commerce e companies. And we're also seeing companies that never existed before, two or three years ago, just form overnight. Give you an example. A typical, typical customer of ours um, are someone that need a big, big warehouse space, 100,000 square feet or 200,000 square feet. So typically, a mom and pop um, fruit stand would not use our facility. But two or three years ago, there's a company form. What they do is they source crowdsourcing on behalf of you know, 500,000 mom and pop stores, and they deliver to them. And that company become a customer. So we're seeing crowdsourcing and integrated uh, platforms forming. So again, that's changing our, our business in the, in the technology, technology space. Again, what, what are some of the things that we are doing uh, to help um, reduce our uh, customers' um, costs and improve their efficiencies? You know, one of the things we do is that um, in our warehouse, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, uh, but it doesn't matter how big a warehouse, there's a limited space, what we call dock, uh, dock space. That means that if the truck comes in, you got, you got the um, build goods, and then you got to go collect uh, all the goods from the different racks, stage it there, and put it on a truck, and leave. So typically, the old way of doing business is that a truck comes, the driver present the uh, bill of goods, and then, uh, and then the warehouse operator go and collect the goods. It could be in half an hour, it could be an hour. So now we install a smart gate in front of our warehouses that we, through GPS, we actually know which truck is coming beforehand. And the bill of goods are sent to the warehouse operator. They can pre-select uh, pre the goods, be ready. When the truck comes up, load it, it's gone. That's efficiency. So that, again, technology is coming in play. We believe that with, with um, the development of Internet of Things, everything will be connected. And I think we're going to see a lot of that technology in the logistics space and the warehouse space. We're also seeing that um, about sharing economy. In the past, every operator uh, needed to have their own set of forklifts. But actually, every business, they don't always use those equipment efficiently because there's peak and um, they probably only need that for like 10% of the time. 80%, 90% of the time is sitting idle. So we're actually creating uh, these uh, truck lift uh, company, service companies that provide a shared economy so companies can use it throughout different time and charge it on per use. So again, that's shared economy come in play. 
and it, it reduce everyone's cost and Im improve the utilization of all assets. So we, um, here's an example, um, some of the things that we are, um, we're doing. We're actually uh, investing in, um, in, in information platforms that can create the matching of trucks and goods owner. So that way, the problem that I talk about, 40% uh, trucks being empty on the return route at any given time, that's being reduced. So we invest in uh, platforms that become the broker using information systems. We also, uh, I mentioned to you the truck, uh, the fork forklifts are being utilized to share, share among uh, customers' uses. We, I talk about the smart gate, we, uh, we, um, implement, we're also tracking trucks, uh, where they're going. We're working with the city of Chengdu. Um, Chengdu had a congestion problem. Uh, they, they have these uh, trucks that come in and block a lot of the traffic in the city. So the, what they did, they say, from seven o'clock during the peak rush hours when people go to work, no delivery truck can go into the city. So they implement the system. The problem is that they didn't realize is that these trucks go, in there, go into the city four o'clock in the morning when that policy was implemented. So we work with the city of uh, Chengdu to implement a, a, a system where we track all trucks at any given time and study the patterns. So now with that connecting to our uh, logistic parks, we can uh, properly regulate uh, what time these trucks go in and then come up with policies that can enforce and, and make the city uh, uh, less congested. So again, that's another uh, way we're using technology, how to manage the logistic um, um, environment for, for even cities. So again, these are things that we, we're working with both the government and the, and the, and the city uh, and, and, the, and the customers to how to improve uh, efficiency and how to reduce uh, the cost of doing logistic from 18% GDP to more of an international standard, say 9% 9, 9 or 10%. So again, that's uh, just a, a snapshot of some of the things that we're doing um, beyond just the, uh, a warehouse provider. So. Great, thank you very much mm. indeed. Mm. So, I mean, we've got quite a few questions have come in for you, and I hope you don't mind to take them. So, the first question says, uh, um, what do needs do e-commerce businesses have in their distribution operations that are different to standard storage or distribution companies? Obviously, you've mentioned the refrigeration one already, but would you like to make some more observations about that? Yeah, I think on the e-commerce front, um, I would say China's actually, um, in many, many ways, is um, uh, ahead of the U.S., because we we have you know we're number two we're number two player in the U.S. and number one in China, we, what we're seeing is that um, because a lot of established infrastructure and in, uh, was not there, so China actually bypassed mm -hmm. in many ways, kind of like skipped the landline, went directly to the mobile phone uh, in in the in the retail sector. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing is that uh, China was the first one to say we can deliver same day, mm -hmm. and now we're seeing that uh, deliver twice a day. And we have service now providing 30-minute delivery. So it, because each this requirement required different uh, fulfillment centers. Mm. If it was uh, delivered within one day, you could, you could locate a facility, a warehouse, within 100 miles uh, from, the, from the city. You, you can make that one, one day deliver. Mm. But if you're making twice deliver, you've got to be close to the city or within the city. If you want to deliver within an hour, mm. you've got to be in the, in the neighborhood. Yes. And if you... If you had to be delivered in 30 minutes, mm -hmm. you gotta be in the same compound uh, uh, center. So, so we actually, GLP have invested in smart lockers. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we work with all the major um, express companies in, in, uh, in China, and we have already delivered uh, 50,000 standalone smart lockers where the goods are dropped off and the message sent to you, and you can go, down, go downstairs and pick it up um, mm -hmm. when you're not at home. So, so uh, it could go as, um, as close as deliver to home, deliver to, the, to, to your, um, your compound, to the neighborhood um, uh, fulfillment center, to the city uh, fulfillment center, to the regional center. So it all depends on the requirement of time, different locations. Great, thank you very much. And you've anticipated one of the other questions, which uh, asks you whether you think there's going to be more major logistics facilities inside cities. And, uh, and, uh, and does your company have plans to do major developments actually inside cities in order to meet these needs? It sounds like you do. Yeah, we, ha we have, um, the model will be different. Um, it's hard to um, secure sites in, in, 
infill locations. So what we do is we we'll work with a lot of um, existing assets that are owned by state-owned companies and how they utilize them. So we uh, have been very active work with um, a lot of um, state-owned companies in China to utilize existing assets. Um, I, I, do, I do believe that um, uh, technology is changing so fast that um, we will probably be seeing uh, more and more requirement for infill locations inside the cities. Mm -hmm. But I think what's going to happen is that it's not going to be a model where every company have their own fulfill fulfillment centers. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to go to a shared economy mm -hmm. because it's kind of like, um, um, for instance, like right now every company has their own trucking company, uh, have their own warehouse. Someday, I think the, uh, there's going to be shared uh, fulfillment centers and share trucking routes. Mm. It doesn't make sense for everyone to deliver uh, one partial. It's not the most efficient use of, uh, of uh, asset and equipment. Mm. So my prediction is that we're going to start seeing more and more of the share of uh, facilities, mm. share of the trucking, mm. and even sharing of delivery men. Right. I think delivery men in the future, if not replaced by robots, will be shared by many companies instead of one company. Great. And so basically, you're going to have smart apps uh, they don't work for any particular company. They work for themselves. And then when they see an order, they just place it just like Uber. Uh, you just secure the order. So I think that's the trend we're seeing towards. So you might have a delivery person with DHL and UPS and FedEx badges all on the same person. Or they could be me and you. We yeah. have, uh, it, anyone could be a delivery man uh, yeah. eventually. So um, there's that model already in, in China that yes. uh, in, if I happen to be going across the town, I can pick up a partial and deliver over. So already there's application for that too. Great. Now, I have a few more questions. I'm going to ask you one, then I'm going to see who in the room wants to come in. But the question that I want to ask you first is about corporate social responsibility. The question goes that, you know, this is obviously a huge growth industry. What are you doing to give back to society? What are your policies towards young people and, and other social uh, uh, um, imperatives? That's something I'm, I'm pretty proud of. Um, so we have a commitment um, in China for every, um, for every uh, dollar we invest, for basically for every square meter we built or manage, we put a dollar towards a fund. Uh, we call it spring uh, fund. So now we have about 100,000 uh, kids in the remote rural area that are less privileged. We teach them um, music and, uh, and English. And people say, why teach music? It's because the traditional way of Chinese education is kind of cramped down. You got to remember this, you got to do this. And then every class, there's only two or three kids are considered smart, the rest are dummies. So we want something that is hard to master and like every kid feels special. Uh, so now we have 100,000 kids enrolled in the program. Um, the head of the program uh, used to be the chief operating officer of the private school that my kids goes to. So I, I poach her. And, uh, and I took her out of my, my kid's school, and then now she's re uh, living in the remote area. And uh, from, she's from Australia, and she, she believes in it. And, she, and now we have, um, we're using technology, uh, connecting um, the privilege and less, less privilege with WeChat, and teaching uh, kids English mm. and music. So um, the program is, uh, is something that we're very proud of. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, um, let's open it up to the people in the room. Karen could be first. Who else would like to come in? If you could bring the microphone down, thank you. And then we'll have Henry. And, uh, and then there's a lady over here. I'm sorry, madam, I don't know your name, but you'll be next. So we'll take these three questions. Right. Uh, you mentioned that instead of charging per square foot in terms of the lease, you charge by parcel. Do you, is that based on cubic capacity? You know, we are experimenting this right now. So um, uh, right now we actually... Uh, we just entered an uh, agreement with a customer that we say, okay, why don't we just uh, measure by total volume throughput? So right now we have measured more by partial and not by, by because partial come in different. Uh, so we're just going to yeah, buy. That's why I thought cubic capacity would be yeah, better. It's, it's hard right now to, uh, because the technology only measures throughput on the per partial, and we still don't have the, uh, the technology to measure cubic volume yet at this point. I, I do believe that in the future, technology will get to, uh, to the point that you can measure by, that, by cubic meter. So Karen should really patent that idea right now, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Karen, I, could you pass the mic to Henry? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Ming. Uh, yeah, talking about uh, more responsible and higher and best use of land and real estate. So what would be to GLP's next step? 
with uh, in terms of enhancing the value of the real estate that you own? You know, I, I think um, it's interesting. We were actually working against ourselves because uh, as we get more efficient, technically, you should need less inventory and you need less space. Uh, so, um, and so we are working against ourselves. Uh, but if we don't do it, someone else will do it. So, I think um, we're doing this, doing the uh, Earth a, a favor by by using less. Um, our whole goal is to use less and do more. Um, as far as um, getting more value for the for the um, for the real estate that we own, um, I think um, one of the things we did is uh, we spent a lot of money with um, McKenzie. So McKenzie and us develop develop a um, a site selection uh, uh, software based on your um, uh, for a company like JD.com that has millions and millions of partial deliver. Um, they do, they themselves don't even know what's the most optimal site. So we used uh, the software that we developed at McKenzie and populated all the orders they have done last couple of years and come out with the best optimal route so it could reduce uh, the time and the, and the transportation cost based on their customer base and their, um, uh, their patterns. So we, uh, we're using technology to, to optimize uh, those sites to mm -hmm. reduce, reduce um, carbon footprint, uh, reduce... Uh, time and truck uh, wasted on, on, on the route. And it's amazing, even companies that pride themselves to be the best in, this, in the business, um, uh, like uh, Walmart, they're using our tools now to do, uh, to do the populated data and do the site selection. So that tells you something, Henry, about uh, where to go for the solutions next. Thank you very much. Yeah. Madam, you're waiting, yes. Yes. Hello, hi, I'm Hui Min from um, Singapore. Yes. I have a question regarding the future of using shared resources in the shared economy. Um, so when we have shared delivery men, shared uh, truck routes and all that, how do you deal with security? I mean, it's the same thing yeah. with all kinds of shared yeah. economy, but that's, that's in a, parcel delivery particularly, I think that's that a be very good question. One. That's a very good question. So um, China, the Public Security Bureau just passed a law uh, April 22nd. No one's following it, but it's just passed. Uh, that uh, when, uh, when a sender, a sender sends a partial, they need their ID and their picture taken and then a link to the public security database and confirm it's that person. Because uh, even if you have an ID, you could be faking it. So they want traceability. Because there has been instances where people send um, explosive, uh, poisonous things through, uh, through, through the system. So, uh, is, a, is a major concern and is something that they very much focus on. The reason it's not being implemented is because the equipment cost, the verified ID, costs 2,000 RMB per person right now. So they're going to figure out how to cost 100 RMB per person. And so it's a, it's a, it's a cost issue, but it's something that the government is very much focused on. Uh, so yes, so not only ID, but actually need to be uh, uh, instant verification that is that person. So not only... Um, uh, um, need to uh, verify it, but it need to be live too. So th that is a very good question. It is something that uh, being very much focused on. Great. Now we've got two final questions, which we'll try to do quite quickly, if we may. So one colleague asks about the impact of drones uh, on delivery in short time periods. Do you think that uh, drones are going to increase, and will they reduce the delivery time? I think um, if it wasn't a concern about terrorists, I think drone would be the best uh, way of delivery. Mm. Uh, I, think, um, the, um, I think there's going to be a constant struggle between efficiency and, and safety. Um, I, I don't believe a drone in a short time will be, uh, will be allowed to, um, because you just don't know um, uh, how, to, how, to, how to regulate it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. And then there's one other question that says, you know, uh, a lot of the changes that we've been talking about here relate to very large, very dense cities and markets. What about low density areas and smaller cities? Will they benefit in the same way from the logistics, logistics industries? And will you need different solutions? For I think by, by choice, you're living in a dense, uh, less dense area. You don't want to be rushed. So. <laughs> Slow living. <laughs> I think you just have to live a slow, slow lane life, slow, slow life, you know. Yeah. Um, dense, only the system that can deliver 30 minutes, an hour, it can only be afforded is a density because you've got enough frequency to justify the system. Yeah. So people that are living in a less dense area, they just need to enjoy that slow life. You know? well, that's a perfect note to end yeah. on as people relax into the afternoon. Yeah. Ming-Mei, thank you very, very much indeed. Yeah.